So in a shocking move, Ben Shapiro made a fool of himself the other day, tweeting a long, harshly critical thread about the new Ryan Johnson film, Glass Onion. And I just wanted to spend a bit of time digging into how he misreads this film, where he's going wrong here, and why this thread is just wild. Because he's saying some really dumb stuff here, and I think it goes beyond your garden variety, Ben Shapiro bad take. I'm gonna try not to repeat what others have said on this already. For instance, as all the quote tweets have pointed out, misdirects and red herrings are the bread and butter of the mystery genre. You really can't tell a story like this without them. The same's true of deception on the part of the writer, but that's basic dumb on Ben's part. The common Shapiro L, poor media literacy, the type of stuff we've seen from him a thousand times before. But I I think his criticism of this film reveals a deeper thickness on Ben's part, a rarer, more advanced stupid. The rest of this basic dumb is worth pointing out too, of course, because it is at points bafflingly, fiercely thick. So let's get through that before we get into the steaming, meaty core of this idiocy pie. There are signs here that Ben just wasn't paying attention to the film, like basic factual inaccuracies. We find out Miles Braun didn't invite Benoit Blanc just 26 minutes into the picture, for instance, as soon as we get to the island, not one hour ten minutes in, and incoherent points. How can we have known who the murderer was from point one, Ben, if it took us half the film to even know who the victim was. And talking of odd points, moron of a murderer isn't a common murder mystery trope, it's actually the opposite. This genre is defined by the trope of murderer as mastermind, Machiavellian killers flummoxing the police, their crimes so considered, so planned out, that, you know, it takes a whole novel, episode or film for the smart Alec detective to suss it all out. Exceptions exist, obviously, but claiming Miles' stupidity here as formulaic is baffling. Reading this tweet boggles the mind, and it honestly scans like Ben wanted a list of three common tropes the film relies on, could only think of two tropes in it, and then just named something that happens as a third for rhetorical effect. It's such an uncommon beat for stories like this to hit, that discovering this fact that Miles is a dummy takes both the audience and the master detective the majority of the film's runtime. In some ways, this is the central mystery of Glass Onion. The fact that this villain isn't a mastermind, that he's acted fairly straightforwardly on impulse. It seems like it should be elaborate, planned out, but it's only as we, Blanc and Helen, experience these events, these realizations, that the truth becomes clear. And no, Ben, that isn't Ryan Johnson calling his own writing dumb. That's Ryan writing about the way we assume those with power are better, smarter than us, the way we give them so much credit for free. Believe it or not, there is a difference between lampshading bad screenwriting and writing a dumb character who pulls off a dumb plot, who nearly succeeds because the characters and the viewers are expecting sophistication, to set up the film's real resolution, relying as it does on this uncoupling of status and worthiness. This demystifying of wealth, material success, and great man theory. It seems Ben didn't get this. Ben has a different take on what Glass Onion is about, one less concerned with themes or ideas, more direct, because later on in the thread, Ben claims that the central point of the film is that Elon Musk, the real life uh, person, is stupid, and that everyone who thinks otherwise is paid off. Ben builds on this interpretation by, get this, criticizing the fact that Miles as a character isn't identical to Elon Musk, and claiming that's bad writing. I actually love this little one-two punch by Ben. Taking a fictional, amalgamated billionaire caricature, claiming that caricature as a one-to-one -one direct depiction of a real person, and labeling textual evidence to the contrary as bad writing. That is really the pinnacle of media criticism. And you know, Ben's right that if this film were trying to make a point, push a theory specific to Elon Musk and nobody else, doing so via Miles, someone with an obviously and significantly different life story, would be pretty weak would be bad writing, but here's the dumb part. Ben doesn't consider for a second, doesn't seem aware of the possibility that there are other options here, that his initial interpretation of the film isn't necessarily the correct one. If you'll permit me a little conjecture here, I promise it'll be relevant later, Ben thinks he's smart. Ben thinks that he gets storytelling. Ben wanted to be a screenwriter when he was younger. It seems that Ben has enough, possibly misguided, faith in his own skill as a critic that he's assumed his gut reaction to Glass Onion is obviously on the money. Ben's interpretation doesn't work though, right? This isn't Elon. Miles is different enough that if this film were an Elon hit 
piece and nothing more, it'd be a poor one. Ben sees this failure, and because he thinks he's all that, he assumes the film is flawed. In reality, there's another option. Ben's interpretation is flawed. Now, I'm sure this is blindingly obvious to most of you, but if you've got an idea that a film's trying to say something, but that idea doesn't line up with the film itself, it generally makes sense to at least consider the possibility that the film is fine and your take is bad. Needless to say, Ben doesn't bother. The thread ends with Ben saying that the characters shouldn't have done what they did, and should have done other things instead, and the problem here is tripartite. First, that all of this is grounded in what Ben thinks would happen in a world where the shitheads went public, and it's hopelessly naive. Claire would become president for revealing the power plant she greenlit was a health and security risk to countless Americans? Do you think so, Ben? Second, the actions they did take are perfectly in character. Even if Ben's right, if all of these things would happen if the shitheads turned on Miles, which, yeah, pretty big if, they're shitheads, they're selfish. That's the characterization we've been given, consistently. They're keeping their heads down, riding his coattails. They don't want the risk, the confrontation. They just want to keep quietly benefiting. Third, since their actions aren't out of character, the role of the critic is not to argue that they could have acted differently, to imagine alternative directions the story could have taken, it's to look at the story we got, the decisions we got, and analyse them, not the imagined alternatives. So Ben's saying a lot of silly things here. He seems to misunderstand criticism on a basic level, he's just got details plain wrong, and upon finding it impossible to make sense of something, he's just blaming the thing for his own failure to understand it. As I said up top, nothing particularly new here. But again, there's something deeper, something that goes beyond good critical practice, or the man's understanding of one film, so let's work our way there. I want to start with some mild, qualified praise. Ben is right about one thing. It isn't something he says, not directly, but it is a thought he seems to have had, and which looks to underpin some of those tweets. This film's structure isn't normal. Ben's noticed this and has taken it to some pretty dumb places. The idea that half the film is pointless, that it's just an exercise in deception, etc, etc. But there is a point here, somewhere, right? For all the valid mockery Ben's faced for complaining about misdirects in a mystery film, it isn't exactly typical for a film in this genre to be quite this non-linear. To use practically the entire second act to reframe so much of what we'd learnt in the first hour. Don't get me wrong, flashbacks to recontextualize or thread together details new angles on the familiar, even beats like a twin twist, or I don't know, the existence of diaries. These are par for the course, but they tend to happen at the end, not in the middle. These things tend to get pulled out at the climax, when the jig is up. But that's not really how it goes in Glass Onion. No, here, the Helen twist, the flashback, they kick off rather than conclude the rising action in the film's second act. Fundamentally, of course, the structure is a familiar one. Setup, crisis, climax, and all that. It's just that Glass Onion constructs this sequence in an uncommon way. Instead of a linear progression in which we follow characters chronologically, finding new information as they do, the film is non-linear. Audience perspective is carefully directed. Fabula and Scheuzhet, the chronology of the story and the film's presentation of it, aren't necessarily tied here. And the result is that instead of finding new pieces of the puzzle to complement and recontextualize the starting handful, as it were, the most important steps forward in Glass Onion are those same pieces, found again, but in a different light. The idea of reframing the scene, the way we look at the plainly visible, the way our sight is clouded by expectation and assumption, is at the very heart of this film. We heard Miles make all those gaffes, we saw him give Duke the glass, we saw the red of the envelope behind the Fibonacci frame, but we weren't listening, we weren't looking. We were looking for crystalline layers around the glass onion, rather than just looking, really looking at its centre. In organising the film, its narrative structure this way, in hitting the audience over the head with the fact that these missing clues had been dancing around in plain view, in tying the story's payoff directly to the basic, interpretive act of viewing the film, Glass Onion is able to make this central point about wealth, status, and the way these attributes distort perception ring true on a near-visceral level.
He's the advanced stupid then. Ben Shapiro is entirely blind to this effect, this remarkable melding of form and sentiment because he's already condemned Glass Onion for doing things differently. Let me explain. Thinking about the way the different segments of the film operate, Ben's wrong here in that aforementioned common, unremarkable way. The first hour isn't a misdirect, it's set up, and without seeing these things here, the film can't later reframe them and pull them all together. Similarly, it obviously isn't a waste of time. Ben misses this, seemingly, because he's watching the film with a basic awareness of this genre, how mysteries tend to be built, what some of the common tropes and contrivances tend to be, and so on. He knows what flashbacks are, what exposition is, the function these devices might play in a bog-standard detective story, and the points at which they might be employed. But he isn't willing, or perhaps he isn't able, to understand a story which uses familiar genre conventions in new ways. And that's the centre of all this. Ben sees a plot which uses non-linearity and reveals to get going instead of just to tie things up, and seems unable to understand this as anything other than a technical error. When Andy's murder is added to the mix, he just assumes this is the murder now, the murder around which the film centres, that the previous death and everything before was empty misdirection. He's seemingly unaware that the film can be about multiple murders, or that it can feature multiple murders but be about something else. No, for Ben, this is a detective story, and detective stories always have an actual murder we're supposed to investigate. The crux of the matter is that Ben can't conceive Glass Onion might be bucking the norm intentionally, adopting a slightly non-conventional variation of this mystery structure in order to better reflect the story's ideas. Now that's likely due in part to the fact that Ben, you know, missed the ideas, but given the way he can't understand a non-linear structure as anything other than an hour of wasted time, given the way he sees an imaginative, pointed, and thematically appropriate exploration of perspective as being being deceived by the writer, it kinda seems like Ben just doesn't understand art. Doesn't understand that to make something new means rearranging, iterating upon what exists. Ben doesn't seem aware that in many cases, the artistic conventions of today are the experiments of the past. No, Ben looks at divergence from the norm and sees not innovation, but aberration, failure bad writing. At this point, it's tempting to link Ben's blind adherence to norms and conventions, his abject failure to perceive change, innovation as potentially good, positive, anything other than transgressive, to his politics. But that feels like a cheap move, and let's be honest, we all know he's not a politics understander already. No, I want to stay fresh and link it back to Glass Onion, because there's a really beautiful irony here. Ben thinks he gets storytelling, that his judgement here is sound, that he's willing to call out poor quality lefty films that no one else will, because Ben, like Miles, like every other one of these out of touch rich pricks, thinks he's a disruptor. He's got his platform, he likes to posture as some threat to the system, as an enlightened scholar saying it like it is. But like Miles, like these other so called disruptors, he succeeds because he got a kickstart from privilege, because his resulting position leads people to assume he will, to assume he's saying something of value, that he understands films, or culture, or society. He succeeds because people are so captivated by the glass onion's delicate layers that they never think to just look through the centre and see a man talking nonsense. The silver lining of all this is, of course, that these disruptors start believing their own hype, start taking these assumptions of their brilliance as evidence for it, and because of this, every once in a while, while, the layers fall away. Every once in a while, people see the Emperor's new clothes. Every once in a while, Ben Shapiro's gonna make a thread like this, and it becomes clear as day that he's not a disruptor, that his judgement isn't sound, he's not thinking outside the box, so much as perpetuating it. These people aren't disrupting anything, and we need to stop automatically giving them credit. We need to look, really look, at who they are and what they do. Jordan Peterson doesn't understand Orwell or Elliot. Matt Walsh doesn't understand fairy tales. Elon Musk doesn't understand Twitter or politics or many things, really. And Ben Shapiro, well, he doesn't understand Glass Onion.
Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Remember to like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. This will be the last non-Patreon exclusive video of the year, but soon enough I'll be putting out another Glass Onion video, as well as a long delayed video on the Lobster King himself. Until then, thanks to all my Patreon supporters, especially Tig, and Happy New Year.